Welcome to Midweek Bible Study. My name is Omar, and I just want to take the time to welcome you. It's uh, so good to be with you. Sorry it's this way. I wish we had uh, actually a service where I could see your faces and, and, and be with you in person. Uh, so one of the things I was telling my wife that I miss most is, uh, is seeing everyone. Some of you know me here, and uh, some of you watching have had the opportunity to meet me, and I've had the opportunity to meet you. And uh, there are some, some of you I haven't had the opportunity to meet, but I do look forward to meeting you. So welcome to Midweek Bible Study. <clears throat> um, I, this one is a little different because I'm going to get a little personal with you and you're going to learn a little bit about me, even though it's this way. Um, I probably prepared 10 different sermons uh, for this parable. And uh, those of you who know me know that's true. Um, so I, it was a struggle. I was like, I could, I, God gave me something to begin with, but I tried to skirt around and do it my way. And uh, it took me until... Uh, early this morning to put the finishing touches on it. So, yes, I had my seven month pregnant wife helping me late last night. She was yawning and taking notes and, and dictating as I was giving it to her uh, just to help uh, me find what God wanted to say to me and to you today. So we're going to read from the parable in Matthew, chapter 25, verses 14 through 30. Uh, this is called the parable of the servants. But if you read it in Luke, it's called the parable of the talents. Uh, it's the exact same story. Uh, it just hit, highlights uh, different points. But we're going to look at Matthew and, and comb through that together. So Matthew 25, verses 14, 14 through 30. Again, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. He called together his servants and entrusted his money to them while he was gone. He gave five bags of silver to one, two bags of silver to another, and one bag of silver to the last, dividing it in a, in a por proportion to their abilities. He then left on his trip. This is an ancient custom that if a businessman or businesswoman who was wealthy would go on a trip, they would often appoint one servant to administer the duties uh, to make sure that things ran in their absence. So everyone who was listening to Jesus would be nodding their heads saying, OK, we're with you. The servant who received the five bags of silver began to invest the money and earn five more. The servant with two bags of silver also went to work and earned two more. But the servant who received the one bag of silver dug a hole in the ground and hid the master's money. Here we're starting to see some distinguishing characteristics between the servants. After a long time, the master returned from his trip and called them to give an account of how they had used his money. Now, this is some language that if you're not listening, you, you'll, you'll look over because I did a few times. He, he, gave, he asked them to give an account of how they had used their money, his money. The servant to whom he had entrusted the five bags of silver came forward with five more and said, Master, you gave me five bags of silver to invest and I have earned five more. The master was full of praise. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount. So now I will give you many more responsibilities. Come, let's celebrate together. The servant who had received two bags of silver came forward and said, Master, you gave me two bags of silver to invest, and I have earned two more. The master said, Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I will give you more responsibilities. Come, let's celebrate. The servant with one bag of silver came to the master and said, Ah, oh, master, I knew you were a hard man, harvesting crops where you did not plant and gathering and cultivating what you did not cultivate. I was afraid I would lose your money, so I hid it in the earth. But look, here's your money back, all of it. Look how the unfaithful servant responds. He has the attitude already that God is somehow impossible to please, so I won't even try. He has a wrong view and understanding of his Lord. But the master replied, you wicked and lazy servant, if you knew According to your own words and your own heart, if you knew that I harvested crops where I did not gather and did not cultivate, why didn't you deposit my money in the bank? At least I would have got some interest on it. Then he ordered, take the money from this servant and give it to the one who earned 10 bags of silver. To those who use well what they are given, even more will be given. But those who do nothing with what they have even what little they have will be taken away. Now throw this useless servant into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's some tough language, man. 
But I, I look at this that uh, in, in, in the way the, the Jewish people speak to each other in, in parables, in poetry, these things are shocking for a reason because they're designed to grab our attention. So when we see the unfaithfulness of the servant and, and the reward that is opposite from what his, his co-workers got, it's there for our attention. So when everybody would walk back home after hearing Jesus teach this, they would be talking among each other. Man, did you hear what happened to the, to the unfaithful servant? Man, I'm not trying to be that unfaithful servant. You see? So in this par parable, I saw three things that I want to highlight that really spoke to me personally. First, I want to talk about a faithful servant. The second thing I want to talk about is the unfaithful servant. And the third thing I want to talk about is being faithful with, God, with what God has entrusted to us. There were some things about the faithful servant that I like, that I think we all see in ourselves, that a faithful servant follows instructions. God always gives us specific instru instructions, especially in his absence. He gave us instructions. It's from Genesis to Revelation. Faith without deeds is useless. And this is what we're seeing with the unfaithful servant. It's almost like receiving money to invest, but then you bury it in a hole until I come back. It doesn't make sense. But James explained it very well. And I'll read from James chapter two, verse 14. What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but don't show it in your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? Suppose you see your brother or sister who has no food or clothing and you say goodbye. Have a great day. Hope you stay warm and eat well. But you don't give that person any food or clothing. What does that do? So you see, faith by itself isn't enough unless it produces good deeds. It's dead and useless. Now, someone may argue some people have faith, others have good deeds. But I say, how can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds? James says, I will show you my faith by my good deeds. You say you have faith for you believe that there is one God. Good for you. Even the demons believe this and they tremble. How foolish. Can't you see that faith without good deeds is useless? To make this personal, when I first gave my life to Christ, or well not first, when I gave my life to Christ, when I heard his voice, I came running with open arms. And whatever they needed me to do at the church, I was willing to do. In fact, I was over the tape ministry, you know, like, yes, cassette tapes. And they even, <laughs> yeah, that, that's a while back. And they even gave me a little pin that said cassette ministry. And I wore that pin so proudly. <laughs> My brother still teased me to this day about wearing that pin and being so proud. I mean, but but I was I was serving God, not the church. You see, I was so excited for and grateful for what God had done in me that whatever they asked me to do, I would do. They said, Omar, anytime the doors of the church are open, you need to be there. I was there. I was motivated from a place of genuine faith. They didn't need to ask me. My answer was yes. God did something for me for which I could never repay. And that love has motivated and moved my life ever since. It was always a heart thing with God. And when I encountered God's love, that's when my heart changed. And it produced different desires in my heart. Desires that I wanted to please him. I told God I was available for whatever was needed because of where you had brought me from. A faithful servant uses well what he is given. What did I have that other people didn't have? Nothing. All I had was the Holy Spirit living on the inside and it was moving in me. So I used my time, I used my compassion, I used my gratefulness, my resources, my love, my availability. And I used all the gifts that God had given me to serve him. What mattered most to me, and we see this in the, the two faithful servants, was that when the master gave them a gift, they got to work immediately. It wasn't about producing the results. It was about showing God that I will be faithful for what you've entrusted to me. I remember I got a phone call from some brothers one time and they were saying, Omar, we got a call from a mother in this community by our church. And the kids had just taken over the community. They were causing havoc, breaking into cars and stuff. And they and they said, we're going to go out there about 20, 30 deep and we're just going to pray over the community. I've never done anything like this in my life. But my answer was yes. 
So 20, 25 of us go out there and uh, young brothers, and we're all out there praying over this community. And one lady pulls up in a car and she says, excuse me, like, what are you guys doing here? And we said, ma'am, we're just walking through the neighborhood praying. And she paused. And the lady began to weep. She had never seen anybody care for kids they did not know the way we did, for a community the way that we did. And she couldn't, she couldn't even get the words out, but she said, thank you. So we called the apartment complex and we asked, is there anything we can do to help? And they said, we we'll give you a space if you'll keep coming back. So we came back. We opened up a tutoring center for the kids and they were able to get tutoring with their homework. And on Friday nights, my friend was a DJ. He'd bring in his equipment and we'd play music and, and play games with the kids. And then uh, once a month, every Saturday, we'd go out and we'd play football in the street. And they loved it. Faithfulness. A faithful servant is also diligent in his good works. This one I struggled with because when it doesn't feel like much is happening, that's when God is asking us to keep working. I'm results driven. I love results. I love metrics. I love data. Give it to me. Tell me how well we're doing. I like that kind of stuff. And when I do well, have my reward ready because I'm coming for it. That's me. I like to win. You can ask Brother Israel and Brother No. We play ball all the time. I like to win, you know. Um, my son Joshua, when he was born, he's going to know that about his dad. Uh, but, you know, one of the things that um, I realized is that Jesus told his disciples at any moment he could return. Just like the master in this parable, he told his disciples, be prepared, be found faithful, because I am returning. And I remember the passage in Acts where they said, men of Galilee, why are you staring at the sky? Jesus left, but he will return the same way. Be ready. You know, one of the things that people don't realize is that I pray for people that I don't even know. Because I, I remember when people prayed for me and I didn't know it. I see an ambulance or a car accident. I pray. I don't know who I'm praying for. I don't know what the situation is, but I pray. And I noticed this was different about me because I've never done this before. I never took the time to pray for where that fire truck was going, where that ambulance was going. But I knew that prayer worked because I'm the evidence of it. So I pray and I'm faithful and diligent to my good works. The gift of prayer is what God has given us. Are you remaining faithful to prayer? When you remain faithful at the end of the journey, we will receive the fullness of our priceless inheritance, eternal life with God. But don't let it be an inward working only. In other words, don't just receive the gift of faith and salvation and keep it to yourself. It's almost what the, the unfaithful servant did. He dug a hole and hid what his master gave him so that when he returned, he could present himself and say, look at what I have. Everything you gave me. Wow. Missing the point. Yeah. The point was, were you faithful to what I entrusted to you? I remember hearing Pastor Philip one time. Uh, I was new to Oasis uh, around this time, a few months in. And uh, it was uh, give Oasis a year is what he said. And I'll never forget that because what I heard was, can you be faithful to God in this house for one year? I heard a challenge. Remember, I'm competitive. <laughs> so I told God I accept that challenge. Let's go. As soon as I said yes, I remember somebody came up to me and was like, Omar, you want to do growth track? I said, what is it? They told me. I said, yeah, let's do it. Hey, Omar, you want to do internship? What is it? They told me what it was. I said, yeah, let's do it. Hey, Omar, you want to paint the kids wing? Yeah, let's do it. Omar, you want to serve in parking? Yeah, let's do it. You get a yes. You get a yes. You get a yes. You get a yes. Everybody got a yes. But the point was, I was saying yes to God the entire time. Yeah. Not to the task or to the work before me. I was saying yes to my father. I committed to my yes. So when God has given us a gift, he's looking for our yes. 
When I look in the Bible and I, and I look at examples of faithful biblical men, I think we all go to King David. And his story is so unique. It's so beautiful to me because he was just a young shepherd being faithful to what his father entrusted to him, which was his flock, his sheep. Not knowing that David leading his sheep to green pastures and still waters would later translate to experience of leading a nation. Being faithful over small, he was rewarded with much. He had no experience being a mighty warrior. His father entrusted him with a staff and a shepherd's rod and a slingshot and said, boy, I sent you out with 100 sheep. You better bring me 100 sheep back. So David had to make sure these hungry bears and lions did not devour his father's sheep. This was their livelihood. It was the thing that God gifted to them that they were entrusted with. So David knew, I have to protect these sheep with my life. It's what he did with the nation of Israel. When I look at my personal life at Heroes, I think about a man named Jack Ludwig. He is a beautiful man. My father grew up without his father. He was in the military and discipline was what he knew. So oftentimes he'd bring that home. And he never spared an opportunity to discipline me. I was the oldest son and I have three younger siblings and an older sister. So I was always the one who was receiving the discipline. The correction is what he called it. But in my opinion, it went too far. I want to honor my father, tell him that I love him, and I forgive you. God has taken me on a journey in my heart to be able to even say those words. But I didn't understand what God did for me when he brought Jack into my life. Jack had a family. He had grandkids. He was a busy man. He worked in corporate America. But he would always call me and say, Omar, you got time to eat some barbecue? I said, yeah, Jack, if you buying. <laughs> so he'd pick me up and we go eat barbecue. Omar, you got some time to, to come with me on the boat this Saturday? And I'm thinking it's going to be us and the whole family. It's just me and Jack on the boat. I said, man, this man about to take me out, you know? <laughs> but, uh, but Jack was just that kind of man. He put his time and compassion into my life, not knowing that I needed to be fathered. Yeah. Yeah. And it wasn't until I had my own daughter years later that I realized what Jack was doing was teaching me how to be a father to my children. I called him one day. I could barely get the words out and I began crying. And I just told him, thank you. Thank you, Jack, for teaching me how to be a father. Thank you, Jack, for showing me how to spend time with my children. Thank you, Jack, for taking the time to listen to me. Thank you, Jack, for taking the time to feed me. Thank you, Jack, for taking the time to be a father to me. Thank you, Jack, for teaching me what it is to be a father. He just said, you're welcome, Omar. That's all that needed to be said. You see, in this parable, Faithfulness to God is revealed in our hearts, but displayed in our actions. Amen. Ways that help me to stay faithful when it's difficult is I remember my testimony. I remember where God found me and what I was doing and where I was and who I was. So when the road gets tough and I don't understand all the theology and all the mysteries of God, and I just look at my starting point. And I look at where I am today. And those who know me well, my God is what they say. My God, God did something with him. I also stay faithful by remembering his promises. Sometimes life is hard and we get lost in the midst of it. Sometimes we lose careers that we built our whole lives. Sometimes businesses go under. Sometimes children are disobedient. But remember the promises that God has given us. And let this anchor you in your most difficult seasons of life. I'm also faithful by remembering that God judges me by his love and not according to my sins. So me being who I am when I get into it, God is always there encouraging me to remain steadfast and faithful. 
because he has the father's heart. And this is what Jack was teaching me the whole time is how to see God. Now that I'm a father to a beautiful daughter named Isabella and she can walk and open doors and and run and color on things and open cabinets and climb things. I'm constantly reminded of the father's heart. It's how we are when we get into things and we stray off and we go places and we get into things. I, God, I don't scold my daughter. I make sure she's safe. And then I instruct her and teach her from that place. And this is what God does to us. This is the purpose of this parable. This parable is teaching us and instructing us from a father's heart saying, I'm coming back. Will I find you faithful? Well, I find you using what gifts that I gave you. Listen to what Jesus says about a faithful and unfaithful servant. Luke 12, 42. And the Lord replied, a faithful, sensible servant is one whom the master can give the responsibility of managing other household servants and feeding them. If the master returns and finds the servant has done a good job, there will be a reward. I tell you the truth. The master will put that servant in charge of all he owns. But if the servant thinks my master won't be back for a while, he kicks back and he starts acting up and beating the other servants and partying and getting drunk. The master will return unannounced and unexpected and he will cut the servant to pieces and banish him with because of his unfaithfulness. Hard language. I know. But the purpose is, again, for us to pause and reflect that there are consequences when we don't use well what we were being, being given. But the beautiful thing about the father's heart, something that Jack taught me, was that we can always continue again on the path of faithfulness because our God is faithful and he accepts us. I think the unfaithful servant servant should have prayed this prayer. Lord, I'm not sure I can do this on my own. I know you're leaving and you will return, but I still I feel myself wanting to be lazy and just do me for a while. Father in heaven, can you give me the strength to use well what you have given me? Your loving servant, Omar. I don't want to miss out on what God has for me because I'm unfaithful. In the parable, it says that when you are unfaithful, you don't receive more. In fact, it says what little you've been given gets taken away. And the other thing is you don't get to celebrate with God in the great feast. God says, I will seat you myself, put on an apron and serve you. I want that. The other thing is you don't get to hear the praise of the father. Well done, my good and faithful servant. The master of the house calls his servants because he has entrusted them with the spiritual gift. Each of us has been has been given a spiritual gift of faith. But there's also another gift that's unique that God has given each of us, and it's used to encourage and build up the church, one another. It comes from 1 Corinthians 12, 7. A spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. And further down, it says that it is the one and only spirit who distributes all these gifts. He alone decides which gift each person should have. And it goes on to say that the gifts are different. Some Uh, teaching, some prophecy, some gift of tongue, some gift of interpreting, but all of it's used for you and I to encourage one another with. Um, I always get the image of the little hand in the Munsters. I don't know if you remember that show. It's an old show, but it's a hand that's detached from the body. And it's like somehow we're just a hand just running around, but not knowing we belong to a body. Like, hey, hand, come back to the body. Like, be a part of it. And that's how I wanted to look at, like, don't be the hand out here doing its own thing because it's limited in what it can do. But when it's a part of the body, we can achieve all that God has designed for us to achieve. Some of you are probably Googling that now because you don't know it, but that's okay. (laughs) I feel like God in this season is asking us to remember to be faithful to what he has given us. Has it been difficult in this season to hear from God? Has it been challenging because we're not at church? Are you seeking to use well what you're given? The return of Christ is often described as a thief coming in the night. In the parable of the servants, they knew that the master would return. But like us, they don't know the hour or the day. So you and I have to be prepared at a moment's notice for the Lord's return. 
This is a loving warning to be faithful and using the gifts that God has given us and not to be like the lazy servant who hid what God entrusted to him in a hole in the ground, keeping it to himself. If Jack would have kept his gift in the ground, I don't think I would have ever been father. I'm grateful to God for Jack. Thank you, Jack, for using well what God has given you. I want to take this time to end in prayer with you. Father in heaven, thank you for this journey. Thank you for bringing me to a, a gift of salvation and eternal life with you. For that, I am eternally grateful. God, help me to remember to use well what you have given me and to be a faithful servant. Not just for me, Father, but for my loved ones, my brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord, if you didn't send me Jack, I don't know if I would be the father I am today to my children. Help us to use well what we are given. Lord, I thank you. Lord, I'm available to you, and I know my brothers and sisters are available to you also. And Lord, if we find ourselves unfaithful, help us, God, to pray the prayer, knowing that you are ready to accept us again, knowing that you are ready with your arms open wide to receive us. God, we know that you're coming back and that there is a reward for those who were found faithful. And there's also judgment for those who were found unfaithful. Help us to hear the warning that you're giving us today so that we might examine our lives. We might take a good look within and say, Holy Spirit, reveal to me some areas. I'm not being faithful to what you've entrusted to me. And the Lord will do that for you. I look forward to seeing you guys in the future and hearing how God has uh, really shaped for you what he's entrusted to you. Go out and be a jack in someone's life. I love you and thank you.